many people are flying out tonight? I'm just curious. We got one, one or two. Yeah, everybody else is going to stay drinking. And How many people are going to DEF CON afterwards? Yeah, there you go. You can already tell some of the DEF CON folks are here. You know, every, the smoke has just quadrupled from all the smoking. Okay, we're just going to start off with a short video the project came up with about a month ago. One of the challenges that we, the HoneyNet project, have been running into with this whole, all this honeypot stuff and the HoneyNet stuff is you go to um, those management types, you know, the guys with the ties and the, or the gals with the ties, and you're like, boss, this great honeypot thing and this HoneyNet stuff. And their eyes glaze over. They just can't figure it out. You want what? Build a computer to be hacked? Yeah, you know, boom, they shoot anything down. So one of the things we wanted to do is conceptually build a nice, pretty little video that even they could understand. Yeah, 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 yeah. Fuck. Oops. All right. No, 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 no. Okay. Good thing all the porn sites weren't up there. That would have been embarrassing. Okay. So one of the things we're trying to do is, wouldn't it be great if we had a short two-minute video where you could show the management types, everything about the honey, all this, all this honeypot stuff? So that's what this is. It was put together by uh, university folks. So we'll put it together. And uh, there we go. Where's the sound? And for your viewing pleasure for the next two minutes, Sorry about the feedback there, but the, the uh, volume thing is right next to the vent, so the vent's putting out air. So the whole purpose of that uh, two-minute video that you just saw was to show your management types. Explain to them what all honeypots are about, all that kind of good stuff. We're actually developing another video right now. 
that doesn't focus on honey nets, but just um, honey pots in general. Something a little on the generic side. Okay, looks like we pretty much got everybody in. Let's go ahead and start the festivities and fun. For the next hour, what we hope to keep you conscious with is the exciting world of honey pots. This is not going to be a general basic overview of honey pots. I'm starting off with the assumption that the folks sitting in this room, you know what an idea, you know what a honey pot is. We're going to start off with a couple slides just covering the basic concepts, but I really want to jump into a lot of the geekier things that are coming down the pipe. Um, where honey pots have come, of all the different areas that honey pots are going, things like that. In general, what I'm really seeing is honeypot technologies are really taking off. It's kind of like what Marcus Random calls the hype curve. I don't know if you've ever seen Marcus uh, present on this, but what Marcus often says is when a technology first starts, it's just the geeks that are playing with it. No, not too many people see it. Then as the geeks play with it and develop, you start seeing it more hit the radar, more you know, marketing, things along those lines, commercial products. And then it really becomes an established commercial product and the marketing people take over it and come up with all these fancy marketing names. And then, boom, it, the hype curves goes back down again as it becomes a kind of a, a commodity, kind of like firewalls are nowadays. Marcus was actively involved in both firewalls and IDS systems from the beginning. So he's got a good sense or feel for this whole hype curve thing. And Marcus likes to think that honeypots are just at the beginning of where that hype curve is going to take off. So over the next couple of uh, years, actually probably the next 12 to 18 months, you're going to see a lot of new commercial products, a lot of new concepts, things like that. And what you're going to should see here in the presentation is honeypots can come in so many different manifestations because they can do so many different things. A honeypot doesn't even have to be a computer, and we're going to be talking about that. So expect to see a lot of wild and different things coming online here soon. Just curious, for everybody in the audience, how many of you have ever actually deployed a honeypot? One, two, okay, so we're doing about 10%, about all right? Uh, for example, I'm actually running a honeypot right now on my laptop. Very simple, nice little honeypot, something called KF Sensor. And if we got time, maybe I'll just show it real quick to kind of give you guys a, uh, an idea. But all right, let's go ahead and kick things off. First of all, about myself, my name's Lance Spitzner. I'm founder of an organization called the HoneyNet Project. That's where a lot of my uh, honeypot research goes into. But I also play with a lot of other honeypot concepts. I uh, wrote the book, Honeypots Tracking Hackers. That's actually the very first book on honeypots ever. Little suggestion, little advice, something I learned. When you write a book, there's something very cool about writing the very first book on a topic. Because this was the very first book on honeypots ever written. And the nice thing is, is you can just make shit up. Just make it up. Because there's nobody you have to reference. There's nobody you have to document. I mean, look at my references in the book. They're like this, this long. Because, you know, nobody's done anything like this before. All I've got is really Cliff Stoll and, uh, you know, Bill Cheswick's work. So it makes it very simple. I mean, for example, when I did the definition of honeypots in the book, I'm like, oh, gee, what's a honeypot? Mm. I just put something down. And then I would get hate mail, you know, about a month or two later after the book was published. You know, where did you reference your honeypot, you know, definition? Where did you come up with this? Where do you come up with that? I'm like, screw you, I just made it up. I mean, there, there's no one to reference. So if you're going to write a book, pick a reference, pick a topic that nobody's ever written anything about, and then you know you're not wrong, at least until the next book comes out. Somebody else writes it up. Um, officer in the Rapid Deployment Force. I was in the military for seven years. That's, uh, I tend to have a very military approach to information technology. You kind of almost see it as a war out there. A lot of times I don't call the black guys hackers or black cats. I call them the enemy. So I'm very used to this mentality and that's how I actually got started in honeypots. One of the big problems we have in information security, and I'm already actually getting ahead of myself so hold on here. Uh, one of the big problems we have in information security is we just don't have information on the bad guys. That's how I got started in the Army. I'll never forget, I, how many military folks we got in here? Okay, three, four, four, five, okay. Yeah, just wait to Black Hat Federal when I ask that question. It'll be half the class. But in the military, one of the things I learned, and by the way, I did nothing with computers in the military. I was a tanker. The only thing I did with computer, uh, computers is right before I put a round down range, I lazed the site and the computer said, you know, this is where your target needs to go. But, so it's kind of odd, you're probably going, you know, what does tanking have to do with computer security? 
Well, you're fighting bad guys. And one of the very critical things that we did in the military is there's entire organizations, military intelligence, that give you information about the bad guys. Okay, you're going to go out, you're going to go fight the Krasnovian unit. It was a made-up unit, but we'd be training in the Mojave Desert. And they're made up of standardized, you know, it's a tank company. Well, I instantly know the enemy, if they're using Soviet tactics, tank companies made up three tank platoons, three tanks per platoon. The tanks are made up of T-72 tanks. Speed of that is probably about 60, 70 kilometers per hour. They shoot 125 millimeter round. Since it's um, an auto loader, they only have three people in the crew, the auto loader, they can probably shoot around every 20 seconds, 15 seconds. You knew all this information about the enemy. The speed of the tank is important, so I know when to call artillery. I know their command structure. They don't have um, strong NCO support. It's purely officers. I know what their motives are. I know what their combat tactics are. They build their tanks like junk because they don't plan on rebuilding them. They're just going to overwhelm you. You had all this information on who your threat was, how they fought, and so you could better defend against them. When I transitioned from the military into information security in probably about 96, around 96, 97, I got in, I'm like, okay, who's my enemy? So I started researching it and there's no information. All we had was the exploits that the bad guys would use to attack us with. Because as geeks, that's how we perceive the enemy. But there was no how are they organized? Why are they attacking? What do they do after the break in the systems? So you had this problem. We had no information against the threat. So the very first thing I wanted to do was let me learn about the bad guys. After I realized there was no information, well, what's this honeypot concept? You know, there's this idea where you can build computers for the bad guys to break into. So I went out and I was like, okay, I'm going to build my first honeypot. But I couldn't find any information on how to build a honeypot. So I'm like, all right, cool, I'll just make it my own. However, I'm a horrible, horrible coder. I can barely spell C, let alone code in it. Perl and stuff like that are just beyond my capabilities. So, me being me, I'm like, well, screw it. I'll just take a firewall, build a firewall, slap a computer next to it, or actually a computer behind it, and see if anybody hacks it. It's brilliant, it's simple. And anybody on the HoneyNet project will let you know I am horribly impulsive. I'll do it and I'll do it right now. I, do, I don't do any planning or anything like that. I mean, I much more release code that's absolute crap today than try to make it perfect next week. And I actually tend to see that. It's almost like a military. In the, in the military, we have this idea, we'd rather have a good plan today than a perfect plan tomorrow. Well, engineers and software developers always want to make it perfect. So me and the software developers are always fighting. But anyways, I, I digress. So I'm like, okay, I'll just take something that was like Linux 5.0, a Red Hat 5.0, I'm sorry, and I stick behind a firewall. And I'm like, let's see if anybody attacks it in the next couple weeks. So I put it in there, and I'm like, this isn't, no, I just put this computer out there, I'll see if anybody hacks it, and I'll wait for the next couple weeks. And this is on the, you know, my wife and I are in a little apartment sitting on the dining room table. So I put the computer on there, boom, and I hadn't done any planning. I didn't even know when a bad guy was going to attack it. In less than 15 minutes after I put this computer behind my firewall, the little lights on my ISDN router started blinking like crazy. Oh, just like that. So they started blinking. I'm like, what's up with this? So I look and I'm like, holy cow, somebody just hacked in my computer. I was all excited. I turned to my wife. We had just gotten married. Like I said, we're living in a little apartment. I'm like, Anya, the computer got hacked. Look at the bad guy's on a computer. She's like, you mean there's a hacker in our, in our bedroom, or actually our living room? I'm like, yeah, this is awesome. She's like, this is horrible. Pull the plug, pull the plug. I'm like, <laughs> I'm the security expert. This is my first honeypot. I'm not pulling the plug. I know what I'm doing. She's like, you better pull the plug. No, no way. I, I'm not pulling the plug. Meanwhile, while I'm telling my wife I'm not pulling the plug, the bad guy gets into the system, realizes it's a honeypot because I didn't allow him to go back out to the internet. He gets all pissed off at me, RM slash star, blows away my entire hard drive, blows out of there, losing all the information I could get. And I'm looking, I'm like, oh, man, I just lost everything. The hacker wiped my entire honeypot. And my wife looks at me and goes, I told you to pull the plug. <laughs> so I haven't been living that one down. But that was my first honeypot, and it was a total failure in absolutely everything except one. It worked. I got the bad guy. And from there on in, the HoneyNet project and all the honeypot guys have been doing nothing more than one mistake after another and learning from those mistakes. So that's what we're all about. That's what whole, this, how this whole honeypot thing started. It's really become my passion now, and in fact, it's what I do full time. So um, it, it's a lot of fun because it's just a whole uncharted field. And you're going to see here in the next hour, 
There are so many different directions to go. I could be doing this for the next 30 years and I probably won't even hit the tip of the iceberg. All right, on the honeypot side, I do a lot of work with all sorts of three-letter organizations because they're just a lot of different types of things you can do with it and stuff like that. In general, what's surprising is on the more advanced honeypot sides, it's, it's the military, government, educational folks that tend to be the most interested in this educational, uh, as in research universities. So I've had a blast working with all sorts of organizations. Okay, the whole purpose of the next hour is really to cover the latest developments of honeypots. Like I said, there's so much stuff going on out there that I have a hard time keeping up. Now what's really neat is because I am dedicated to honeypots and one of the few people dedicated to honeypots, whenever somebody comes up with something new, they bounce it off me or I'll talk to them. So I've gotten a pretty good feel for everything that's happening out there. There's a lot of fun and exciting things. Some all sorts of organizations building different concepts. It'll be funny, I'll talk to organization A and they're like, wouldn't it be cool if we had this? And organization B is already developing it. So there's a lot of exciting things happening. The agenda is we will start off with an overview of honeypots. There's a lot of misconceptions on what a honeypot is, its value, why people care and don't care. So I just want to relay the groundwork for that one. Then we're going to talk about the two different types, low and high. Gary, you still look hungover, man. <laughs> like what's, that's one of Cora's finest. But, um, so what we're going to talk about is low and high interaction honeypots. Really two general different types. I personally like high interaction honeypots better because you can just do so much for, more with them. Low interaction honeypots are probably more what commercial organizations go with. Just to get a feel for you folks here, how many represent a commercial organization, a dot com? Okay, about half. How many of you would be government, military, or educational? And then we got the rest of you who are like, screw you, I'm not raising my hand. <laughs> you're too tired. Unless there's a beer involved, you're not raising that hand. All right. So we're about half and half. Good. Well, it'll be a nice mix. Okay, honey pots. This is where I love to have my little Winnie the Pooh. Uh, they gave him a right here, but, you know, Disney just doesn't go for Winnie the Pooh and honey pots when I'm talking about hackers. So I don't keep that image up there anymore. So you have no image. Okay, the problem. Can't talk about a solution unless we understand the problem. The problem, but as I see it, is this. Every one of you sitting in these, this room right now is trying to stab, protect a big, fat, static target. It doesn't matter who we work for. But our networks are static and the bad guys know where they are. The bad guys can hit us whenever they want, however they want. They have the initiative. One of the things I learned in the military was the initiative was very important. You know, the best defense is a good offense. You don't let the bad guys you know, attack when they want, how they want, stuff like that. So even from the get-go, we've got a problem. They can scan our networks day in, day out, every 10 minutes. And the moment they find a single mistake, they're in. And actually, that's how a lot of them do it. So if you have 30,000 computers in your network, I'm sure a lot of you have 30,000 network uh, computers in your network, and it's not a problem. Uh, the problem is, is all you need is one of those 30,000 to have be misconfigured, unpatched, things along those lines for 15 minutes, and there's a good chance they're going to get broken into. So the bad guys really have the advantage. They can just keep doing whatever they want, however they want. How can we turn the tables around? How can we take the initiative against the bad guys? Well, I like to think honeypots. And before we transition to that, let me just give you an example. One of the great things I really enjoy about working about honeypots, especially from a research perspective, because that's my motive for honeypots, researching the bad guys. I don't have a network to protect. I want to learn about them because I'm in a research position is the bad guys are always thinking out of the box. I, I hate that cliche, but they're always coming up with something new. For example, what I'm going to do in the next two slides is show you how we, the HoneyNet Project, um, totally screwed up thinking the bad guys are going to do this. And the bad guys did something totally else. And it was only because we had layers going on. Um, just real quick, the HoneyNet Project, because uh, I don't have it in the slides here, if you're not familiar, it's an all-volunteer, non-profit security organization that does just researching on bad guys and sharing it. The project has no, um, no products, no services, no employees, so it's a really bad business model. But we've been doing it for four years and we still managed to pull it off. 
But let me give you an example of how the bad guys are always changing. Now, I just love it because it keeps it interesting. You know, people are always saying, you know, and they keep saying the same thing. Well, we keep, we're starting to see different things. And this also points out another thing I love about honeypots. At first, when we started deploying honeypots, was the purpose was to learn how bad guys break into systems. We quickly learned that's the boring part. It's just, you know, every week it's a new exploit, but it's still, it's an exploit. The buffer overflow, they bust the way in. What we quickly learned is what they do afterwards. That's fascinating. For example, our friend, the Australian hacker, he breaks into one of our honeypots. This is about a year, year and a half ago. He breaks into one of our honeypots, standard exploit, and runs a process. Starts up a root kit, running a process on our honeypot. Well, what the hell is going on? What's the prop purpose of it? All of a sudden, our firewall logs are picking up IP protocol 11 going to the honeypot. Now, what's IP protocol 11? Well, let's see here. ICMP, what IP protocol is that? One. Protocol six. TCP. Protocol 17. UDP. Protocol 11. Yeah, that's what we're like. Huh? Protocol 11? See, what the problem is, we get so focused on IP, you know, TCP, UDP, ICMP. Don't forget, there's about 150 other IP protocols out there. IP protocol 41, you know, IP protocol 38, things along those lines. Sure enough, IP protocol 11. If you look at Etsy protocols, it's network voice protocol. Some obscure protocol I think Microsoft came up with. So what is happening here is this. Why is this guy sending IP protocol 11? None of our sniffers were picking it up because we told our sniffers, Sniffers, grab all TCP, UDP, and ICMP. That will grab everything the hackers do. And we screwed up. Our sniffers weren't taking any of it. Only our um, IP table logs saved us. So we're seeing this IP protocol 11 traffic going to our honeypot. Why? Well, fortunately, we've got some pretty sharp dudes, uh, Yod de Haas, on our team. Took the binary the bad guy was running on our honeypot, reverse engineered it, developed a decoding engine, and started analyzing these IP protocol 11 packets being sent to our honeypot. What were they? They were commands being sent to the honeypot. This process running on the honeypot, which could be running on one of your hack computers, silently and passively listened for encoded IP protocol 11. It's a backdoor accepting commands. It's not listening on any port, so you're not going to find any listeners. Scan all your computers for any port listeners. If there's an odd port, you've been hacked with the back door. Bad guys are way ahead of that. This guy's nothing but a kitty. All right? Bad guys are way ahead of that. They're just running, you know, uh, cur no, listeners that passively listen, grab any IP protocol 11 command, uh, packet, decode the packet, execute the command. So that's what this bad guy's doing here. If you look at it, it says, honeypot that you've been hacked. Go out, download this toolkit, execute it. Once you've executed it, remove the binary so there's no trace of this. So that's what he's doing here. And notice how he goes out to another computer, just another hack computer acting as a distribution center for malware. What was he downloading? This toolkit, once downloaded and ran, was not a standard IRC proxy. No, 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 no. What it was, was a tool scouring the internet for email addresses. They'd go to ICQ sites, IRC sites, big websites, and just scour the entire website for email addresses. Now, why was he collecting email addresses? Criminal intent. He wants to sell them to spammers. The more email addresses he gets, the more he can sell to spammers. The more computers he hacks, the more programs he runs, the more um, emails he gets. Uh, one of the things we're learning with our honeypots is the misconception of bad guys are really nothing more than misguided use to explore the internet. That's crap. The vast majority of time when we see our systems broken into, their motive is money. Either they're dealing in stolen credit cards, they're going ahead and they're uh, scanning the net for email addresses to sell to spammers, getting paid to launch denial service attacks. The bad guys are often criminally motivated. And what's interesting here is this, is um, in fact, we confirmed this is an Australian, and we act, this guy's actually in jail now. Not because of what we found, uh, we were told afterwards. This is part of, I, some of you might see this as familiar, the reverse engineering challenge we had, the reverse challenge. Last year, the HoneyNet project actually put this binary up on our website and challenged the community to reverse engineer it. And what was interesting is when we put the challenge up there, 
the uh, Australian police contacted us and you know they're like they're saying hey one of the guys that submitted the answer to your challenge he's now in jail See, that, that was actually the hacker <laughs> so not the most and the way we really know that this hacker was not the sharpest you know the sharpest tool in the shed is um, when we released the reverse engineering challenge this whole reverse challenge one of the questions was you know after you analyze the code do you think we're dealing with an advanced hacker or just a you know script kid who doesn't know what he's doing out of the 32 re, uh, entries we got, 31 of the entries said, this is a script kitty who doesn't know what he's doing. He doesn't know how to code or anything like that. And of course, we got one entry that said, oh, this guy's elite, massively good coder. He knows what he's doing. As you can figure it out, it was the hacker got sent to jail. The sad part was that in this reverse challenge where you're supposed to reverse engineer the binary and figure out what his code did. Remember, that's all, this, that's all reverse engineering is. Figure out what the purpose of the binary is and how it works. Even though the guy coded and developed it and hacked our honeypot, he still only got seventh place in the challenge. I mean, six people were able to reverse, better reverse the binary and document it better than the, only, the guy who actually did it. So this was interesting. Now this is something I actually think I found much more interesting. This happened three months ago. What IP protocol is this? It's not even IPv version 4. Well, actually it is, but it isn't. A honeypot in Mexico was hacked by a group of Italians. Any Italians in here? Okay, cool. <laughs> actually, yeah, we think that these Italian guys might be have already been arrested too. It's funny, we share this information with all the different uh, the, the, the law enforcement are like, yeah, I mean, because we post it on our website and LD will come back and say, oh yeah, those guys got busted. Um, what's interesting is this, Honeypot in Mexico gets hacked by a group of Italian hackers. Once again, standard Solaris exploit. Who cares? Total IPv4 network. But the bad guys run a script and enables IPv6 on the Honeypot. Why would you want to enable IPv6? There's, we're not running IPv6. What the bad guys did is they tunneled all their communications through IPv6 being tunneled in IPv4. So even if you have only IPv4 networks, there's bad guys enabling IPv6 in your networks and then tunneling their communications. Now, you tell me one IDS vendor that can analyze, decode, and trigger alerts based on tunneled traffic. None. There are no commercial vendors that I know of that can understand IPv6 traffic. So what you see here is an, a packet where you can see the payload but you know you don't know if this is TCP, UDP, ICMP, or you just know it's IPv6 traffic being tunneled in IPv4. So the bad guys, once they go into tunnel mode, you now have a problem where a lot of your technologies can't decode it, can't analyze it. So once again, here's an example of a honeypot showing you the bad guys are always doing surprising things. Well, the Honeynet Project, once again, we're in IPv4 networks, we don't have to worry about IPv6. Wrong, you do because the bad guys will enable it. Now, Snort can handle and decode IPv6 packets now, only because about 10 minutes after we saw this hack, I had Marty on the phone. Marty, please, add IPv6, you know, and then he created a patch. This is why I take Marty out for beers whenever I get a chance to go out with him. Of course, now that he's a CEO, he's much, much more difficult to get a hold of. Um, so, honeypots really allow you to take the initiative on the bad guys. Look what we are able to learn and much uh, other things. Because when they hack, break, attack, probe, play with their systems, they are doing exactly what you want them to do, which is a lot of fun. The definition of a honeypot has changed a little bit. Remember I told you I just made it up and I stuck it in my book? About three months ago, uh, we had a discussion on the honeypot mailing list and what a definition should be. There's about five to 7,000 people on the mail list. And this is the definition the mail list decided to come up with. An information system resource whose value lies in unauthorized or illicit use of that resource. Notice how we say resource. It doesn't have to be a computer. We're going to be talking about that in a minute. Basically, the whole value of the honeypot is the bad guys working with them. Now, in general, all honeypots share the same concept. No production value. No authorized activity. So if anybody is interacting with them, they're bad. Or at the least, at the very least, if you have a honeypot in your internal network and somebody interacts with that honeypot, you at least have a problem on your internal network because nobody should be interacting with it. It's an anomaly. You know, honeypots should have nothing, so anything interacting with it is an anomaly. 
at the lowest, at the, at the minimum, maybe you have misconfigured DNS, or Nancy in marketing is looking where she wouldn't, she shouldn't be looking, she got lost. But most likely you've got malicious activity happening on your network. That's the beauty of honeypots. They're so brain dead simple. Which is good because I like simple. All right, now what did I just do? Okay, now what's really cool and what really a problem for honeypots is they're not a solution. They don't solve a specific problem. Firewalls, prevention, intrusion detection, detection, encryption, that maintains integrity and privacy. All these technologies solve a specific problem. Honeypots are kind of like, you know, a, a general tool. What that is, they can do so many different things. You can use them for detection. You can use them for prevention. You can use them for incident response. You can use them for research. You can use them to identify internal threats. So that they come in many different shapes and sizes. In the past, this was a huge problem. You get 20 people in a room and you have 30 definitions of what a honeypot is because they can come in so many different ways. They can be used for deception, like uh, Fred Cohen's toolkit. This is what makes them so cool, though. You can do so many different things with them. Now, we have two general categories of honeypots. And this is important, because when I start talking about how they're advancing, we have to use the general categories. Low interaction and high interaction. Interaction is a measurement of how much activity we allow the bad guys to interact with on the honeypot. In general, the more interaction you allow, the more you can learn. The honeypot example I showed you earlier, we captured the network activity, we captured their keystrokes, we captured their conversations, is what we have high interaction honeypots, real operating systems for the bad guys to interact with. Now, the problem is, is when you give real operating systems, you have real risk. What's to stop the bad guys from using your computers to hack other people? Nothing, unless you put some prevention me measures in there. So, the more interaction you give the bad guys, the more you can learn. Also, the greater the risk. So we have low and high interaction. Low interaction primarily emulates services. This is the traditional idea of honeypots. Things like NetFacade, Fred Cohen's uh, Deception Toolkit, Back Officer. It emulates so it's much easier to deploy and it controls the bad guy's activity because you have these emulated services. But it's really limited because you can only capture what you expect. You can't capture new root kits, conversations, because you can only capture what these emulated services allow. So they're very limited. Now I, for research, don't like low interaction honeypots because I can't learn a lot. However, for organizations that are interested in detection, oh, low interaction honeypots rock. That's where they're really, really exciting. So what I tend to find is commercial organizations like low interaction honeypots because they really help protect your network. They're great for detection, incident response, things along those lines. Here's an example of some source code from an emulated service. It's a simple script that emulates an FTP service. This script would run listening on port 21. Somebody connects to port 21, it gives them a banner, Hey, you connected to Woo FTPD. It then awaits the bad guy to give him a command. You enter the command quit. This is how the emulated service will respond. If you go ahead and you um, say system, this is how it will respond. Help, respond. You give user, this is how it will respond. So it has all these pre-coded um, expected inputs and then pre-programmed outputs. And at the very bottom of this source code, you would find an asterisk. If they did something I didn't understand or didn't know what they do, just barf out a generic error message and drive on. So it's very, very pre-programmed, but very simple to deploy. This source code was taken from uh, Honeypot HoneyD. High interaction Honeypot is very different. High, under, high action Interpot is used to gain lots of information. Commercial organizations tend not to like these as much because there's a lot of risk and Yes, they can be used for detection, but the low interactions with less risk can be used. So we find that military, government, universities um, tend to prefer high interaction. You don't emulate services, you install real services. If I want to see what's happening on FTP, I install FTP. And here's an example of Mantrap. Mantrap creates up to four virtual cages. And then here's an example of what you can capture with a high interaction honeypot. 
all of this criminal activity going on we're talking about. Two weeks ago, the Huntington Project released a paper on how we're seeing automated credit card fraud. Where You know how we're always concerned about a hacker breaking into an e-commerce site and grabbing all the credit cards and then selling them? What happens if a hacker breaks into an e-commerce site and then just creates an automated bot that listens on that e-commerce site and creates a live feed? So as people keep adding new credit cards to the e-commerce site because they buy things, the bad guys are constantly, in real time, updating a database that's getting a live feed off an e-commerce site. Then what happens if they have multiple e-commerce sites that are hacked all coming to a single live feed? So now they're getting new credit cards constantly in a live feed real time. There's some possibility here, that's what we're actually seeing. So all sorts of very frightening things. Okay, advances in low interaction honeypots. Some examples of low interaction honeypots would include things such as Honeyd, which is open source. If you're interested in starting and playing with honeypots, it's probably one of the best places to start. Honeyd is really neat that it's free, um, runs on both Unix and Windows, there's now a Windows port, and it monitors all sorts of services. Now what I run on my system, since this is Windows right here, I'm just going to show this to you so you can see what a honeypot can look like, is KF Sensor. You can actually go ahead and download this and play with it for free for a month. But if anybody connects to any of the ports that's on this honeypot right here, it will say, hey, we got a bad guy connecting ports, it'll generate alerts, and then it'll go ahead and it can emulate services too. For example, it can emulate file share, Samba, and you can add files there for the bad guys to take and all sorts of stuff. So this is an example of what just one simple honeypot can look like. It's a low interaction honeypot because it only detects connections or it allow the bad guys to do some basic emulated interaction with the honeypot. So what are some of the new advances we're seeing in low interaction systems? Honeyd is really leading the way in this. Honeyd is sending a lot of neat examples. You haven't seen much code released in the past month or two because the coder Niels Provost is now defending his thesis for his PhD at University of Michigan. Once that's done, you'll actually see a lot more new code released. It's open source honeypot primarily used for production services. You can, you can use it for research, but by production, I mean it's primarily used to protect your network. What it does is it emulates services and operating systems. Now, Honeyd really brings forth a lot of new concepts. First of all, it monitors all unused IP space. So everybody here has networks of unused IPs. Traditionally, a honeypot would just monitor the IP address of the interface of the computer. For example, the honeypot I just showed you, KFS sensor, monitors the IP address of my laptop. Honeyd is the exact opposite. It monitors your entire network, identifies all of the unused IPs, and then populates all of the unused IPs with virtual honeypots. So now, instead of having one honeypot on your internal network, if you have a Class A network, it's theoretically possible to have 16 million virtual honeypots all being ran from a single computer. They've actually done that. Um, <laughs> Niels and Doug Song were actually given a Class A uh, network by DOD. They've tried it. So what happens is, is when a connection is made to any unused IP address, up pops a virtual honeypot. As you add and remove computers from your network, Honeyd dynamically sees how uh, the unused IPs is changing and creates new virtual uh, honeypots. So it's very powerful. It can also monitor literally millions of IP, like I said, yeah, monitor millions of IP addresses at the same time. Now do I also go into, so here's an example. Simple network, you've got IP addresses not being used. You deploy a single physical computer, the red computer, and then it populates all the systems. Now what's really neat too is this, um, emulation. One of the problems you'll have with most honeypots, including the honeypot I just fired up for you, is the bad guys can interact with the honeypot and the services will emulate something. In other words, the honeypot may emulate a Linux box, so when you connect to HTTP you get Apache. Or it might emulate Windows, so you get IIS. Or you might uh, emulate a Mac's box, so you get Mac, I forget, what's the web server for Mac? Like Panther or something? I don't know. I'm, I'm Mac illiterate. But you fingerprint the OS stack and the OS stack will always be what 
the system is running on, what type of computer. So for my laptop, it would be Windows. What Honey D introduces is this. It's what um, Niels does is when you run your honeypot, you can not only emulate service level, but you can emulate at the IP stack level. So if you want somebody to OS fingerprint your honeypot, you want it to come back Vax, Cray, Xbox, you know, Palm Pilot, or have what you, he will do it not only at the service level, but at the IP stack level. He does it by running an IP stack in user space, and then how does he spoof all that stuff? Easy. He just takes Fedora's Nmap database, feeds it, feeds it to the user space process, and then replies back to the database. So the bad guys are using Nmap fingerprint databases to remotely fingerprint the honeypot, and the honeypot's taking Nmap fingerprint databases and feeding the answers right back to the attackers on whatever honeypot you want it to emulate. So that's why HoneyD can easily emulate over 500 different operating systems. Because all it's doing is taking Fedora's Nmap database and feed it right back to them. It does the same thing with Ophir's Xtool and its fingerprint database. So if anybody's using active fingerprinting tools. So this idea of monitoring unused IPs and this idea of being able to um, spoof the uh, um, IP stack of different systems is very radical. This is the only product I know that does it, especially the whole IP stack uh, emulation. And then Niels is throwing all sorts of other crap on this. He'll create entire virtual networks with routing hops, latency, trace routes. So if you want to create Cisco routers and then say there's entire networks behind your Cisco router, you can do it with HoneyD. If you want to catch spammers and then have them automatically relay the spammers information to a black hole list, HoneyD is going to be adding that feature. It's very, very powerful. In many ways, Honey D is not even a honeypot. It's a honeypot toolkit that allows you, gives you all these tools to put together a very dangerous honeypot. So I'm a huge fan of Honey D. If you want to go ahead and start uh, uh, playing with honeypots, I recommend you play with it. Some other neat things too, for example, it can even be, whenever it's attacked, it automatically on the fly generates IDS signatures and then gives you the IDS signatures. A lot of universities, when they're researching HOM honeypots, start with HoneyD, so you tend to see all the development stuff happening on the HoneyD side. Okay, now here is a really new concept for honeypots. Um, a lot of organizations are doing some very wicked weird research in this area. NetBait's the first kind of people to play in this product. NetBait introduces the concept of the honeypot farm. And I'm very excited about this because this is going to radically change honeypots for especially large organizations. It's not a product, but it's almost kind of like a service. What it does is it creates a honeypot pool. So in other words, on a very single network, you put all your honeypots. And then wherever else you'd want to deploy a honeypot, you actually create a redirector to that point. I pulled some above images from their website. So for example, this is what you have on your network physically. This is what you physically have. You know, you got a router, you got a server, and then you've got all these systems right here. And then you have this NetBait box, which is the physical box you deploy on their network. Well, two things happen. First, like HoneyD, all of a sudden it creates all of these virtual systems. So attacker thinks there's three or four computers, there's now hundreds of computers on your network. So they scan your network, they don't know which computers to go for. So boom, 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 boom. All these virtual honeypots pop up. But what happens though is these virtual honeypots actually don't reside on your network. They just actually end up becoming redirectors to a honeypot farm that's mainly, that maybe um, the net bait folks keep or that you keep. And then whenever somebody probes these systems, they think they're probing these systems, but all the probes get redirected to the honeypot farm. So let's say um, you have 10,000 networks in your organization. And I, I know that sounds odd, but there's actually people sitting in this room that have 10,000 networks, not computers, networks in the organization. How can I deploy honeypots on a lot of these networks? The answer is simple. You don't. You actually create one single network where you have all your different honeypots residing. Almost like a, you know you have your SOC, your security operations center, but you can have your HOCs now, honeypot operations center. A single operations center where all your honeypots are maintained by your security groups. And then what you do is you take these redirectors 
a FedEx a black box to all your different network admins on different networks, and they just plug in this black box. Now, if any attacker tries to scan, say, any unused IP address in your network, the, those attacks, probes, get redirected to the black box, and the black box gets directed to your single honeypot farm. So now deploying thousands of honeypots is nothing more than deploying a black box to your different networks. So if you've got 100 networks, you just ship out 100 black boxes to your administrators and say, plug in this black box. Now we take it one step farther. Instead of kind of using this net bait concept, these black boxes are layer two VPN devices. So say your honeypot farm is in Pakistan, Karachi, but you want to deploy honeypots all over the world. Well, you just deploy these black boxes so people scan your networks. And then what happens is these black boxes, layer two VPN devices, become almost like wormholes. They suck in the bad guys, send the packet over the VPN around the world to the honeypot farm. So what ends up happening is there's no TTL decrement. There's no routing. There's no MAC address except the MAC address of your honeypots because you're happening over a layer two VPN device. Theoretically, only the detectable notion of how the bad guys realize they've been redirected to a honeypot farm is latency, you know, it, it, which can potentially be just a matter of a couple microseconds. So here, very large organizations can now easily deploy massive amounts of honeypots by only maintaining a single honeypot farm and then deploying these layer two VPN devices to all their um, distributed networks and these layer two VPN devices monitor unused IP addresses. This is really the future for large organizations that want to deploy honeypots. So you're not having, because one of the problems you have with IDS systems, you deploy a thousand IDS systems on a thousand different networks, they have to be maintained by all these different people. With your honeypots, all of your honeypots are in one single operation center. And all you have is these simple VPN devices redirecting to their central location. You already have one commercial organization offering a product or even a service because the Honeypot Operations Center, if you want, resides in their own organization. So they take all the risk or liability or whatever issues you're concerned about. And you're just placing these redirectors on your internal network. Or you can maintain your own. I know of at least two other organizations that are going to be coming out with this in the next six to eight months. So there's a lot of development happening in this field. Now here is another concept, and this is actually a lot of what the HoneyNet project is going to be doing. One of the things we're consistently asked is you create honeypots. How do you get the bad guys to your honeypots? In the past, we did nothing. We just put them out there and they came. Well, because the vast majority out there, 90 to 95 percent of your hackers out there, are what we'd call script kitties. You know, different skill levels. So I don't, I hate the term script kitty because you think you have bad people. Well, don't forget, we saw script kitties doing IPv6 tunneling and IPv4, IP protocol 11 backdoors. So there's definitely some advanced script kitties. But the fact is, they really don't care what computer they hack into, just as long as it's a lot of computers. But how do you build a honeypot so you get that other 5%, that advanced hacker, you know, the state sponsored guy, the ex KGB agent working now for organized crime, the advanced insider threat? Well, the concept would be hot zoning. And what we mean by this, for the first couple years, one of the things we're doing is, well, how do we create a honeypot that has the appearance of high value so you attract the advanced attacker? And what we're starting to think, and where you're going to see the advances going, is you don't. Instead, you take existing systems of high value, and you redirect the attacker from those existing systems to your honeypot. That's what hot zoning is all about. Let's say, for example, you happen to run the CIA's mail server. You know what? I bet that's a high priority target. I bet there's a couple organizations out there that would love to break into the CIA's mail server and love nothing more than to read all the inbound and outbound email going through that mail server. So they get some very interesting attacks, I'm sure, on almost an hourly basis. So what you do is, wouldn't it be great to create a honeypot that can capture all that? That's where hot zoning comes in. We now have a target of high value. You take your real ma mail server, the system on your left. That is the real mail server. That is really where the bad guy is going. You then create a honeypot that mirrors the mail server. So that's the system you want the bad guys to break into. Maybe you even put bogus mails on there so when the bad guys break into them, 
you start reading and think the CIA is doing this, but they've been misled when the CIA is really doing something else. So what happens is this. Anybody from the internet wanting to go into port 25 goes to the mail server. Anybody who is scanning anything not going to bound port 25 gets redirected to our mirrored honeypot. And then you can have things like SSH on your honeypot or things along those lines. It's almost like where this gateway is really a firewall. Normally a firewall would allow anything 25 inbound but block everything else. But instead of blocking, we now have a gateway redirecting traffic to our target system. So anything going to port 25 there, everything not going to port 25 there. However, we can even take it farther. There's some technology called net bait. For example, if a bad guy is going to port 25, what happens if he launches an attack against port 25? Well, something already came out called bait and switch, where if the bad guys go to the mail server, but they launch an attack, the gateway can detect that attack and then dynamically redirect the bad guy to the target system. So now if you have anybody launching attacks against your production systems, those attackers are now redirected to the honeypot and are now interacting with the honeypot. So this is some really exciting thing now because what's happening is, is we're no longer just building the systems and putting them out there. We're now capturing activity against our real systems and redirecting them to our honeypots. And then like I said, A, maybe you're interested to see how somebody breaks into them, or B, you let them break into your honeypot, put some vulnerable service, because you want to see what they're after. And just lure your hacker in. Is it KGB? Is it state sponsored? Is it some wacko? Who is it? And then finally, C, maybe you want to break, let them break in because you know who it is, but you plant all sorts of bogus information on what we're about to call honey tokens. You plant all this bogus information on your mail server. So you put something on your mail server that's called top secret mail. And they go, ooh, grab all this top secret mail and download it to their computer. Little do they know that that top secret mail that's really on your honeypot is a Trojan that's going to take over the hacker's computer, backdoor the hacker's computer, and let you back into the hacker's computer. So you can really take this so much farther. I hope you're beginning to see now the flexibility of a honeypot. Here, we can use it for detection, we can use it for learning about the bad guys, or we can use it to give the bad guys information and maybe even backdoor their own computer. So, you know, what you use a honeypot for depends on just how wicked of a mentality you have. Question? Wouldn't there be legal implications? Hell yes. <laughs> I'm just a geek. I come up with this shit. If you use it, that's on you. Actually, like, a lot of this stuff I didn't come up with, like, like this redirection, um, this hot zoning, is actually an idea that came up with by Marcus Ranum. This net bait and switch is came up by some other folks. Um, I forget the website. Things along those lines. So no, I, mean, I, I didn't come up with this. I just, I'm just bringing it all together. Yeah, sure, there's all sorts of legal implications. I mean, if you're, if you're purposely putting on Trojan stuff on there and stuff like that. But then again, when you start dealing with really nasty bad guys that want to do really nasty things, you know, those legal implications may be worth it. So this, you know, this gives you an example of how you can take a target of high value and switch the tables on the bad guys, take the initiative, and you want them to attack that system because you're going to redirect them to that system and do all sorts of nasty things to them. Marcus Random, you get him started on this and he comes up with scary stuff. Trojaning things and that track them, call home, and all sorts of scary stuff. Um, smoke detector. You know what? Actually, I don't want to get into this because it's kind of lame. Honey tokens. This is what I want to get into. Honey tokens represent a really new concept for honey pots. First of all, it's not a computer. What is it? It's whatever the hell you want it to be. It can be fake patient records. It can be bogus social security numbers, bogus credit card numbers. It can be planted documents. Once again, not new. Cliff Stoll was talking about this. You know what? This concept I'm about to talk about is probably about 5,000 years old. It's about as old as security. But it has a lot of new application in cybersecurity. You've got a database with 10 million records in it. Patients, hospitals. How do you know when somebody's looking at a single record they don't have authorization to? Very hard to figure out and detect. You create a single database record. Call it John F. Kennedy. This is the typical example. You stiff that, stuck that record in your database. Now, if anybody's probing and looking around on the database that shouldn't be, and they come across this John F. Kennedy record, and they grab this record, 
Boom, nobody should be talking to it. It's a honeypot, or actually a honey token. Instant detection. You now have an indication that you've got somebody very naughty looking at database. That instantly doesn't make them guilty. They might have accidentally retrieved the record or stuff like that, but you now have a very early indication somebody might be naughty. You don't go around and bust them, but what you can do is now, hey, we got an indication somebody might, not be, look somebody might be looking at records they shouldn't be, so you can continue to monitor them a little more closely to see if they're doing anything else they, don't, they shouldn't be doing. Take it a step farther. Let's say you're concerned about people on your network reading other people's email. You're concerned about an insider on your internal network reading the vice president's email. How can you confirm if somebody's doing that and who they are and what they're after? Easy. Honey tokens. Create a bogus email. This bogus email is your honey token. You stick it in the vice president's mailbox. So if somebody's reading his mail, they'll come across this. And the mail can say something as easily, Dear Vice President, from your security admin, I've changed the login and password to the major high top secret critical financial database. Your new login is Bob. Your new password is password. Go to financialourcompany.com and you can now pull all of our critical information. So evil insider employees reading all his emails and comes across that email. <gasps> Ooh, I now have the login and password of the vice president. What he doesn't know is you've just, he's come across a honey token. Grabs the login and password, goes to that system, which is by the way, if you haven't guessed, a honey pot. He goes to this financial database that's your honey pot. Uses the login and password. The moment somebody uses that login and password on your system, your security administrator better come running out of bed screaming bloody murder and track that person down because you know you've got somebody naughty. So on this financial database, you take it a step farther and you put all these interesting files on it and you make them big fat files that take a long time to download. So when the bad guy goes, ooh, look at all this stuff and starts downloading it, da -da 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 -da. he's sitting on the computer for a while. Meanwhile, your little SWAT team is mobilizing ready to track him down. Or maybe this information that's downloading these very interesting Word documents actually have macros planted into it. So he downloads the Word document and opens it and goes, ooh, look at all this information. Meanwhile, when that document opened, it launched the macro, Trojan his system, reading his entire hard drive, and sending all the information to your security administrator going, oh, that's Jennifer and Human Resources that just was reading the vice president's email and just access all of our top secret information. Perhaps you even go so far and let her take it and give it to your competitor. Your competitor just paid her $10 million to give their organization bogus information about you. So here's an idea of where honey tokens can go so much farther. In a lot of ways, this is what Cliff Stoll did. Cliff Stoll, in about 10 years ago, had his computers at a university hacked into by some Germans. He wanted to learn what the German hacker was interested in. So he planted all these different files on his hack computer. Financial, top secret, government resources, you know, the research and development. And he saw the hacker look at all the files and grab only certain ones. These are all honey tokens. He saw the hacker grabbing all the top secret information on government military research projects. We now know what the hacker was interested in. But he did something very, very sneaky. What he did is on these files, he added to one of the documents. Oh, by the way, if you're reading this document, you must be a top secret cleared person and know all your stuff. If you would like more information, all this confidential top secret research, please mail a request to this mailing address and then we'll send you more documentation. In reality, that mailing address was Cliff Stoll's home address. Sure enough, he let the hacker go through all these honey tokens on the hacked honey pot the hacker grabbed the one on all the top secret government files, so Cliff now knew what the hacker was after. And then the hacker emailed Cliff a package going, oh, by the way, I read your documents, you know, I'm classified so-and-so, please send me all your information to my address in Germany. So Cliff now had the hacker contacting him with all his whole personal contact information. I mean, it doesn't get any easier than that. So here, by using Honey Tokens, he was able to find out not only what the bad guy was interested in, but he had the bad guy sending him all his personal information. So the power of honey tokens is just extremely valuable. And also the fact that they're pretty damn cheap. What's it cost to create a honey token? 
Just create an Excel spreadsheet nobody should be using. Create an Excel spreadsheet, put it on a file server, call it top secret documentation or research and development. Say you're a car company, call it our latest car under research. All sorts of things. You put it on these file servers. If anybody grabs it, you give the file a long name and you create a sort snort signature. Snort is now looking to see if that is transferred on your wire anywhere. If it's transferred on your wire anywhere, you know you have a bad guy. Same thing, you create bogus credit card numbers, bogus social security numbers. For example, anybody here from University of Texas in Austin? Yeah, right. <laughs> because they had their database of 55,000 social security numbers stolen. Well, what if they had a couple social security numbers in there that were bogus honey tokens? That way they would have instantly known that their credit card um, social security number database was hacked into because these tokens would have been accessed and they could have quickly tracked down who took it. So this whole idea of honey tokens, while conceptually has been around for, I'm sure, thousands of years, can now be applied to information security for detection, identification of the bad guys, maybe even learning what they're after. Or we can give them that bad information to turn the tables around on them. So once again, we're taking the initiative by having the guy, bad guys do exactly what we want them to do by having them interact with our honey tokens. I think honey tokens are one of the most exciting things about um, information security. In fact, I just wrote a paper on it two weeks ago and released it on securityfocus.com. If you're interested, just go to securityfocus.com. There's a new paper on honey tokens. I got more feedback on that paper than I did on the past 20 papers I had released on honeypots combined. So there's tremendous interest in this. Because like I said, there's no licenses, no fees, no vendors to deal with. So it, it's simple and easy. A lot. Question. What happens if uh, the finds out he's in that honey pot? That does he make you think that? Okay. The question. The question is: Is what happens if the hacker is on your honey pot and he figures out it's a honey pot? Is this bad? Is this good? It depends what the purpose of your honey pot is. If the purpose of your honey pot is to detect bad guys, well, if he's on your honey pot and he figures out it's a honeypot, game over. It's too late for him anyways. You saw him come in, you know who it is. Now, if the purpose of your honeypot is to research him or to give him bad information, then that could be a problem. So once again, you start seeing here what you're attempting to do will determine the type of honeypot you develop. Is it low interaction or high interaction? Low interaction honeypots that emulate services also have the disadvantage of being much easier to remotely detect or figure out. High interaction honeypots, especially when properly done, are extremely difficult to figure out that it's a honeypot. Not impossible, but extremely difficult. Question. They try to exploit the gateway machine. I mean, in your example, there was a lesson. Yes. The gateway machine in the middle. You mean in this right here? Um, the HoneyNet gateway, that's what we actually presented on this morning. It's um, a specific HoneyNet technology. This gateway right here is actually a layer two bridging device that has no IP stack on it, making it a little bit more challenging to uh, uh, attack because it has no IP, has no MAC address. Theoretically, you can attack it. That gateway is very hardened. Um, like I said, only remote, local access and stuff like that. If you're interested in how that technology would work, I recommend you go to honeynet.org. I just forgot, really one more cool example on honey tokens and then we'll move on to here. Let's say you are concerned about insiders on your hacker breaking into your internal network or an insider on your internal network, firing up sniffers and sniffing your network for logins and passwords. You can use the honey token again. Why not just dump logins and passwords on your networks? And then if you see anybody trying to use those logins or passwords on any of your systems, you now know you have somebody sniffing on your network for logins and passwords because nobody should be using those logins and passwords. You can even use different logins on different networks. So when you see somebody banging with this login, you know which network you have a sniffer on based on which login they use because you have different logins for each network. Just another con uh, example I forgot. So like I said, the whole honey token thing is really wicked cool. All right, honey nets. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about honey nets here in the last, but I've got five minutes left. Honey nets, we covered a lot this morning, so for some of you, it's a repeat. 
So, so before I jump into here, any more questions on about honey pots or honey tokens or just some of the, a lot of the advances we're going to see so far? Question. Can that make you more vulnerable to DOS attacks by setting up that type of redirection? What's very interesting in the four to five years of the HoneyNet project, we've never been retaliated against by denial of service attacks. Not that we know of. Our website's on an OC12, so sometimes it's hard to know if somebody's DOSing us. And it takes a lot to DOS an OC12. Um, but no, in general, I mean, we get hate mail if you're running honeypots and stuff like that. But honestly, to the best of my knowledge, I don't know of a single instance where the bad guy figured out it was a honeypot and then retribution. In a lot of cases, the bad guys just don't care and they go on to the next site. Like it's a bunch of Romanians. That's a honeypot. Oh, we don't care. Let's just go on to the next site. So retribution has not been a problem. Okay, honey nets. I'll talk honey nets real quick and then let you guys get out of here and drink beer. I'm surprised you're still conscious so far, so, so long. Um, there's a lot of new advances happening in honey nets. I'm just going to cover them, overview real quickly. What's unique about a honey net is the ultimate, ultimate high interaction honey pot because it's an entire network of systems to be hacked into. This is the most difficult system to determine it's a honey pot. Normally the bad guys can't figure it out until they're on the system. Lots of new technologies being developed and released in the next three to six months to make honey nets very extremely difficult to detect, very simple to deploy, and very effective at capturing the bad guys. Snort Inline. How many of you heard of Snort Inline? How many of you have used it actually like Snort Inline? Uh-oh. <laughs> well, the guy who developed it is the short-haired guy sitting right over here. So if you want to harass him, Snort Inline is a modified version of Snort that acts as an intrusion prevention system. In other words, what it does is it allows you the capability of not only detecting an attack, but blocking it. So you take Snort Inline, rub it, run it in front of your web server, and block all the inbound attacks. So for example, you've got a server that you know is vulnerable with a known attack, but you can't patch it because the patch hasn't been tested or you don't have time. So Snort Inline would block all the known attacks. CBEC2. CBEC2 is an advanced system that allows you to capture every keystroke, every file, every action the bad guy makes on the honeypot without him knowing it. You guys are using encryption on your networks. So are the bad guys. Don't have encryption installed on your computer? Not a problem. The bad guys are going to install it for you. We've seen it repeatedly. So you have to have some way of capturing everything the bad guy does without the bad guy knowing it. CBEC2 is a kernel module that will do it for you. Bootable CD-ROM. Remember you folks were asking earlier about this advanced uh, gateway thing right here. This layer 2 bridging device that has all these advanced capabilities. Well, instead of going through all the trouble of having to build that gateway, wouldn't it be cool if I just had a bootable CD-ROM, I stick it in a computer with two interfaces, I boot off that, and I instantly have this layer 2 invisible gateway that can do all these fancy things. That's coming in the next three months. Three, well, more like six months, I should say. Once again, the short-haired guy is one of the lead developers on that. By the way, that short-haired guy that's doing all this developing is actually a captain in the Marine Corps. So I mean, can't give the green, you know, everybody gives Marines hell, but here's a guy that codes preprocessors. And then finally, um, developing some advanced user interfaces. One of the things we're finding here too is honeypots are just simpler to use. So what's very exciting is you're taking the most complex honeypot out there, the most powerful honeypot out there, and the riskiest, a honey net. And we're taking all this capability and combining it onto all these exciting technologies you're going to be seeing in the next three to six months. I think I'm actually going to have to finish up. There's Snort in line, but uh, basically how Snort in line works, it allows you to modify the attack, disabling it or allowing you to drop it. Ba 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 na 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 da 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 user interface demo da da boom. All right, let's just go ahead and finish up. Thanks here. All right, we're just now beginning to see the potential of honeypots. I hope I put all these bugs in your ideas. It's just not this simple box you put out there. All sorts of exciting things: honeypot farms, redirection, hot zoning, honey tokens. In a lot of ways, honey uh, honeypots are where firewalls were 10 years ago. I, Marcus Random made that comment. That's his quote. He's one of the original developers, uh, first developers of honeypot technologies. Finally, if you want to learn more, trackinghackers.com has everything I was just talking about. And then you got the honeypot mail list. And then finally, the most important slide of this entire presentation, buy my book. 
<laughs> All right, thank you so much. Uh, go ahead, go have some beers.